Hey, I'm Julie, Kay Van Balzer, and I have a very Kathleen Turner voice today because I'm a little bit under the weather, but I feel very glad to be here with the uber-talented Tori Wires, who you may know from Instagram as Draw Riot. So welcome, Tori. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Where did your username come from? So before I married my current husband, my last name was Ward, W-A-R-D. And so Tori Ward is an anagram, mixed up letters for Draw Riot. Oh, yeah. Never realized that. I thought it kind of fit because, you know, having an art Instagram and I made my Instagram really early and I wanted something interesting and unique that was still my name. So hence Draw Riot was born. I think that's so cool because it's always part of you. It reminds me of like when people get tattoos that have some portion of their name or something in it. It's always like, well, you know, that's going to be okay because it's never going to change. Yes. Still a piece of me. Right. Now, uh, I, I know you have a, speaking of drawing, right? You have a drawing challenge that you do on Instagram. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I have been doing a drawing day for, gosh, eight or nine years now, maybe it's been 10. It's just, you know, the whole uh, couple of years we lost to all being at home made all time relative. <laughs> um, but yeah, I pick different sources or different inspiration. Um, I've gone through a whole nature period because I felt like I needed to get um, out into nature more. But yeah, I put prompts out or it's really about just creating every single day, even if it's just a little tiny illustration or circles on a page that all of it counts. Just being there, showing up, and doing art is the goal. Well, let's talk about drawing because I know a lot of people, like the first thing that they say is like, I can't draw, or they define being an artist, being able to draw. So what's what's sort of been your relationship with drawing? Is it something you've always loved to do and been good at? Um, I have always done it. Um, except When I was really little, I was really drawn to art right out of the gate. You know, two or three years old, I told my parents I wanted to be an artist and they told me that's not going to make any money. And I was like, I don't care. I, that's what I want to do. I went to art school. Um, but there was a whole period of time as a teenager where my parents were like, got me an art desk and then got on me every single day. Draw. Why aren't you drawing? You should draw. Here's all the art supplies. Draw. And like, I refused to draw. I would paint or do watercolor. Um, so when I went to art school, I really got back into it because learning the fundamentals really makes drawing accessible. So really just looking at shapes, lines, uh, volume of shapes, it doesn't have to be photo perfect. It's really about the process of putting down lines and forming shapes that become a drawing. Um, and once I started doing that again and I started to love it and find my own style in it, I never stopped. I keep sketchbooks with drawing. I love to do nature sketching. Trees are really awesome because they're so organic and um, it's meditative. Yeah, I think drawing is really important and I know a lot of people stay away from it. And and I, I have a sketchbook class that I teach, which is trying to make drawing a little more accessible for people. And one of the things that sort of always comes up is this idea that I um, stole from Milton Glaser, which he's a very famous graphic designer. People don't know, like the I Heart New York, that's his work. And I went to a lecture that he gave many years ago, but he said something that stuck with me, which is, you know, he said, you don't really see something until you draw it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. Because uh, there are plenty of times when you think you know, like uh, how things relate to each other or where the shapes sit or what it really looks like. And when you sit to draw it, instead of drawing what you think you see, you actually draw what you actually see. And it's mind blowing mm -hmm. when you realize how things are put together. And so uh, I think having a drawing practice is a wonderful thing to do, even if you don't ever share it to the internet, even if it never becomes realistic, even if you're primarily an abstract artist. I mean, I know you do a lot of abstract work. I do. But I still think that drawing is there for all of us. Yes, definitely. And I think there's so many I, people get stuck on what should I draw? Anything can be drawn. Your water bottle. When I am stuck, I draw coffee cups because I have coffee every single day. It's a very simple form and shape. And each one is unique and interesting. And that becomes fun and just of itself to see like today's coffee cup looks different than yesterday's coffee cup. But the world around us is just so many possibilities of drawing. It's it's awesome. So once you let go and kind of give yourself permission to just draw. 
Yeah. And I, I think like one of the things that is hard about the internet is obviously that we see people's good work and not their bad work. And people often are, I think like maybe falsely humble about stuff being not, they're, oh, they're like, oh, I hate this or this is not great. And it's like fantastic. Right. And if you really hated it, why would you ever post it? Mm-hmm. And I do think that that's hard. But one of the things I find heartening is every now and then there's been a trend where people show like the first drawing that they did 10 years ago or four years ago, and then the drawing that they're doing now, and you're like mind blown over the difference. And it's so incremental. You don't see it. There's, um, I don't know if you've ever read Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm-mm, I haven't. Well, <clears throat> he wrote this book that's about like basically how to create new habits in order to get whatever that goal is that you want, whether it's like a better body or a better job or who knows what it is, right? But he, there's a metaphor he uses that I that I think is kind of brilliant, which is he talks about an ice cube and its melting point in relationship to progress. And basically he says like, listen, if you have a room that has an ice cube sitting on the table and it's 27 degrees, it's just sitting there. And if it's 28 degrees, it's sitting there. If it's 29 degrees, it's sitting there until you actually get to the melting point, right? And then it starts to change and you suddenly notice a shift. It's still the same one degree from 32 to 33. Mm Mm-hmm. But that was the melting point. And he says, sometimes your progress is like that. It feels like nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. Because it's degree by degree, degree. But we all have this melting point where finally you'll hit it. And the trick is to be persistent. Yes, show up every day. And I think that's that's a great way to think about it. um, Mm -hmm. Because it's not about the perfection of it. It's just about finding the melting point. Finding the Mm -hmm. moment where that, that perfect thing crosses over and it changes. Do you have a studio practice that you like have a routine every day? Um, yes. So I usually after dinner, before bed, um, when the house is quiet and dishes are done and everything's is done, I, that's where I kind of steal my time out. Um, and if I can't make other time, that's always the time. So I love to spend more time in the studio hours a day if I can, if I can help it or plan it in. But at least I can count on that kind of quiet moment. Um, And I show up and sit and I usually leave my supplies out, my main supplies. So little jars of pens and pencils and paintbrushes and my main colors that I'm into right now. And then I just start. It's really just show up, sit down, start. And just that process of choosing that time. And even if it's five or 10 minutes that day, it's the time and, and you just do it. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the, the showing up matters, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, definitely. Well, I know you're not at home right now, so we're not getting a peek into your home studio, but will you tell us a little bit about like when you work? Are you a chaotic mess person? Is it like clean? Is it what's what's your sort of working environment? I do chaotic mess. So I will pull out everything I need um, and let it get all over the place. Paintbrushes are rolling off the table, but I do clean it up always after, or I start by cleaning up. So having order um, when I start and finish is part of my process. And, and even if my studio happens to be clean because I clean it up at the end, I will clean something else in the house. So I will put <laughs> this away or I will fold towels because it's super simple. And there's something about putting something in order that gives me kind of this piece to then sit down and engage in art. Yeah, I find that I work a lot better in a clean studio. I'm just so unmotivated to clean. I wish I had like a little robot that would just follow me around and clean up my mess. That's that would be the ideal. Yes, I agree. So now I um I think you you do vend at some shows and do some other art shows and stuff like that. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that experience has been like for you? Yeah, I st- we have the Indianapolis Art um, Council here that puts out tons of calls all the time for different shows, different themes, and I got really into that. And once you s- kind of start that, it's a little nerve-wracking when I very first started, gosh, way back in 2008, I feel like, um, because you feel like, oh, my stuff's not good enough, all of that. But there's so many shows and so many different people to engage with that you can just start. You will be accepted because they want different looking stuff. Um, so I started that and then that got me into different little galleries that have spaces for local artists. And that's really big, which I'm so happy about that local artists can find place to, to be represented. And, you know, everyone doesn't have to be from New York, um, or Chicago. And then once you kind of start, it kind of starts to snowball. So then other people see you in shows and they ask you to be in other shows or other little gallery spaces. So it's a lot of fun. 
Um, and a lot of that stuff kind of works on consignment. So you give a couple pieces, they sell it, you get a check, and then they're like, hey, your stuff's sold, bring more stuff. And it kind of grows. That's awesome. And have you found anything in particular of yours that you're like, this is like a bestseller? <laughs> yes. So I started doing these circles that started out as a mono print with a, um, like a jelly plate. And then I would do mixed media on top of it. And they started really selling really well. And I actually stopped doing them because one of the things for me is I am a designer and a marketing person by day. Um, and I work on brands and I work in kind of big corporate America and doing creative work. And I don't want to be a commercial artist at night. So I think it's really hard. And some people choose that and that works really well for them. But I really want to stay and continue to push myself and explore and not get comfortable um, because that can happen really easily. So I stopped making those circles and mixed media and I started doing more paintings and teaching intuitive painting. And that's really what I've been into a lot lately. Um, intuitive kind of just process and allowing yourself to give over to the process of making line, shape, color, mixing, and just the flow of art because it's just so expressive and so completely different when I, you know, what I'm doing when I'm trying to meld a brand into something that communicates something. So I have a lot of feelings about intuitive painting and they're not all positive, I will say, uh, which is, which I think for me has always been based on like, I always think that the beginning stages of a painting are intuitive and like somewhere in the middle is kind of intuitive. But then I, I, I think I struggled a lot early on figuring out how to resolve things in an intuitive way. Like I could never do that. And for me, and this may just be the way that my brain works, like I needed some foundational skills. And I think it's probably because I didn't go to art school and I didn't have those skills that it wasn't until I really understood some of the things about like color and balance and value that I like can now somewhat intuitively you know what I mean? Like bring things into actually a finished state, but it definitely wasn't there at the beginning when I was sort of flailing around. Yeah. And I think the concept, I agree with you, the concept of intuitive painting, really, it isn't just coming from nowhere. It's coming mm -hmm. from your experiences, what you've seen, what you might have worked, you might have already done. If you were a drawer before, you'll probably do similar shapes. Um, so I think people can get stuck there because it just feels like, okay, I'm, I have to just create now. What? Why can't I make this work? Um, so actually, uh, and I talk a little bit about the class for uh, the Artful Holiday, that you can make yourself a little cheat sheet. And then you have a starting place to just draw from if you get stuck. Like that's still intuitive because you got to that point, you got stuck, you helped yourself through your cheat sheet move through that. Um, and then you can also do that with finishing touches. So if you like dots and lines or leaf shapes, which I see you have some behind you, yes. you know, going back to what you're comfortable with to finish something or to kind of make it feel finalized or make it feel like you, that can be part of the process too. It doesn't, it doesn't come from thin air. And I think some people get stuck and feel like it should. Yeah. You know, so I used to work in the theater and there's a very famous improv coach called Viola Spolin. And she has a quote that I've always loved, which says, improvisation is the moment when planning and opportunity meet. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like, blah, 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 came out of nowhere, right? It's actually like you've done the work. It's the same as like a jazz trio practices, even though there's improv and they know their instruments well and they know each other. And like, I think all those things are important. But since you brought up the class, let's talk about it. So first things first, people have had such interesting and varied reactions to being asked to do a holiday project. What was your reaction when you got the email from me about doing a holiday project? Well, I, of course, went to the holidays I think we think of right out of the gate. I was thinking, ooh, Halloween. <laughs> oh, Christmas. Oh, a birthday. The things we celebrate all the time um, and that you can really clearly align great projects and creative things just right out of the gate. But um, being, and I already talked about this, being is like, I don't want, I want to be pushed completely out of that comfort zone. Um, I was like, let's find a really obscure holiday. So I started doing research and thinking like, how obscure should it be? Because it still should resonate with people. Um, and I ended up with Arbor Day. And I think I ended up with Arbor Day because I mentioned, you know, I'm trying to get out in nature more. I live by a park and I realized I don't even, it's right across the street. I don't spend enough time there. There's beautiful trees. So why not get out into the park, find inspiration there and get other people outside too. 
I think we want to make time for that, and it's hard sometimes. So Arbor Dave seemed like a perfect fit, and not everybody might know about it. There is some beautiful footage of you in the park in your class video. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now your project, uh, I think, is unusual. It's it's not something that I've really seen a lot of. Is it is it something that just came to you when you were walking around? Yeah, I was walking around and I was thinking really about what kind of class I wanted to do. And I started seeing, um, you know, we had a very windy day and all these sticks and twigs and tree bits and leaves. And I was like, what if I could do something found object? I really want to make a project that's really accessible, limited amount of supplies, gets people thinking or creating it in a totally different way. Um, so I brought some of those sticks back and, uh, my kid and I, Aislinn is her name, started sanding them down and, and playing with them and adding wire to them and other things. And I was like, these could be really cool, just painted. So using line and shape and color. And then I thought that, what could I do? Arbor Day trees, it's found, it gets you in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, and they look really good when you do a bunch of them in the same size, all collected mm -hmm. together. Or you could do really long ones to put them in a vase. They're just beautiful and simple. Yeah, and I think that, you know, holiday decorating to me, whether it's for a holiday that's sort of more well-known or a holiday that's less well-known, is just somehow making a change in your house. And I know that since we've all been homebound for a couple of years now, like you're, I at least am so much more aware of my environment and feel the great desire to like move the furniture and like change where things are and like feel like it's different and not that's just the same groundhog day every single day, you know? And so certainly decorating for the holidays for me falls under that. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, I think I did more decorating over the last couple of years, more Christmas stuff, more Halloween stuff, just because of that, to make it even broader and more unique at those times, made it feel special, more special. So last question. If you had a bajillion dollars and did not have to like work or make money or anything like that, <clears throat> what kind of art would you make? I would make, um, I think I'd make the art I make now just bigger. That's <laughs> amazing. Scale. I would love to do like 10 foot by 30 foot paintings um, would be awesome. And I think the, the any money thing, you need a really big like, huge studio space to do that um, and obviously supplies once you scale up but yeah I would love to just make almost completely expressive giant mixed media pieces I think that'd be super cool you know I did read this article that said that um, contemporary art's getting smaller because particularly in a lot of cities like New York artists are getting sized out of the warehouses and just they priced out and so the work is reflecting the size of studios that they have now which is such an interesting idea it's interesting. Yeah. Someday I'll have a factory and I'll just do it with giant things. Roll out. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for joining me for this little chat. Also for the wonderful holiday class. Um, class is going to start August 1st and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, me too. So excited. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to, to chat. <laughs>